when a network of global terrorists led by ringleader Osama bin Laden destroyed the World Trade Center in New York City, the United States government immediately began preparation for a counterattack. After a series of private meetings held at Camp David, President George Bush and U.S. intelligence experts mapped out a strategy to protect the United States along with its allies around the world and to ultimately conquer the enemy. In this episode of the Antichrist Chronicles, we pull back the curtain and take you to another field of battle involving an attack, a strategic planning session, and a counterattack. Amazingly, the effects of this fierce struggle are being felt today. Here's Steve. One of the most beautiful sights for human eyes to see is a gorgeous sunrise, if you're up early enough to see it. When the sun peeks over the mountains, the sky lights up, sometimes the clouds are full of colors, and those rays of light, those gentle, precious rays of light begin to move out and scatter the darkness. How many of you have seen those beautiful sunrises? Praise the Lord, it's nice to see, isn't it? Something similar happened in the 1500s with the rising of a movement in history called the Protestant Reformation. And just like when you see a gorgeous sunrise, you can see the hand of God, the beauty and the love of our Creator, it is also true that in the 1500s, God moved mightily in the raising up of this powerful movement. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. Let's bow our heads and let's begin with a prayer. Dear Father, dear God, thank you for the chance again to, to share your word, and we pray that, that light will shine in this meeting and around the world through this special series. We ask, please, in the name of Jesus Christ, our precious and loving Savior, amen. Amen. Prior to the 1500s, Europe was gripped, locked in what has been called historically a period called the Dark Ages. Now, I know that this phrase, the Dark Ages, is not really that politically correct today. If you, in your history books, most of the time they'll say uh, the Middle Ages. But Protestants and other people have for a long time called them the Dark Ages. And the reason why they were called that was because primarily Christianity was in a very, very dark and dreadful state. For hundreds and hundreds of years, Europe was shrouded in darkness. There was a lot of superstition. There were not very many Bibles at that, at that time. The printing press hadn't yet been invented. The church was corrupt by and large, although there were scattered lights here and there, but overall there was darkness. Christians were taught that in order to be forgiven, they had to do a lot of different things. Sometimes it was give money and they could be forgiven by buying indulgences. And there were people many times that climbed up stairs on their knees, kissing every step, trying to earn the favor of God. People bowed down to statues. People made long pilgrimages. People joined monasteries and beat themselves, flagged themselves, went days and days without food, all in an effort to earn the favor of God. Surely this was a dark time, wasn't it? Not a lot of people back then had the peace of Jesus. Very few people saw Christ. They didn't see his love. They didn't see his death on the cross. They didn't understand the simple beauty of the gospel, the simple truth of faith. They were blinded, and because of this, there was not very much peace. Now, to make matters a whole lot worse, there was an absolutely awful organization that had been created in the 13th century called the Inquisition, better known actually as the Holy Office of the Inquisition. The Inquisition was in every country of Europe. It was in England. Uh, it even went as far as India, even into South America and Mexico. It, it ruled for 600 years during the whole course of its duration. It was an absolutely awful, awful thing. Uh, there were spies everywhere, all around Europe. The Inquisition could be likened to the German Gestapo, or the Russian KGB, and actually it was a whole lot worse. And if there was somebody that was suspected of heresy, of speaking against the Pope or the Church, the Church of Rome, you might hear a knock on your door at 12 o'clock at night. A black coach would come up to your door, 
People would open the door from the inside and these hooded figures would come in and they would take your husband, take your wife, take your kids, whoever was suspected of heresy. And these people were just taken away, put in a coach and whisked away. And most of the time you never saw them again. It was a nightmare. Many times they were taken down underneath the ground, down below into the basements of monasteries and surrounded by hooded figures. They were questioned and ultimately they were tortured and there were, there, I, I don't even want to describe the different methods of torture that were used. And all of this was done, amazingly, in the name of Jesus Christ. This is a common fact of history. The fires were lit. And millions and millions of people gave their lives, being burned in the flames, because they would not go along with traditions and doctrines and theories that they were taught from headquarters. Can you understand why? This period has been called the Dark Ages. It was a nightmare. There's never been anything like it, like the Inquisition. And all of this was done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the 1400s, a man by the name of Wycliffe, John Wycliffe, he rose up and he has been called historically the morning star of the Reformation. He was an Oxford scholar in England. A movie has been made about him. And it was called the best film by the Christian Film Distributors Association. I've got the film. I've seen it a number of times. And what Wycliffe tried to do was to bring people back to the Bible, back to Jesus. He was a man of God. He risked his life. They never really got him. He lived all the way until he died a natural death. And he had followers that began to spring up and began to spread out over Europe, teaching people the Bible, directing people back to Jesus with the Bibles that they had. And most of them didn't have very many Bibles back in those days. Wycliffe was followed by others, many others. And as these people began to rise up, the sun began to shine little by little. The darkness began to dissipate, and the light of Jesus began to dawn in Europe in the 1400s and in the 1500s. Eventually, God raised up a man by the name of Martin Luther. Luther was in Germany, and then there was John Calvin in France, and then there was Knox in Scotland, Tyndale in England, Zwingli in Switzerland, and countless others. And these men rose up. The printing press was invented in the year 1450 by Gutenberg in Germany. And guess what was the first book off the press? It was a holy Bible. And as the Bible began to be translated, and as it began to circulate throughout Europe, God raised up people who pointed away from the Church of Rome, away from traditions, away from superstitions, away from all kinds of false doctrines that were just gripping people's minds and, and ruining their hearts and their lives. And, and people were pointed to the gospel, pointed to Christ, pointed to his love, pointed to his grace in a way that had, had really never been done before since the early days of Christianity. The Protestants eventually developed certain fundamental principles fundamental basic doctrines. These were, this was their battle cry. And one of them was sola scriptura, which meant only the Bible, the Bible above tradition. Another one was sola gratia, which means only grace. Another one was sola fide, meaning only faith. Another one, ultimately the biggest one, was sola Cristo, which means only Christ. Only Christ. Away from tradition, back to the Bible, back to faith, back to grace back to the gospel, back to the love of Jesus, his tender human love for every soul. Jesus would never torture anybody who didn't believe in him. He gives people freedom. The Protestant reformers taught direct access to Christ, to the throne, to the goodness and the mercy of God. Hallelujah. And they were willing to die for their faith, and a whole lot of them died. They taught that people should go directly to Jesus. You didn't, they didn't have to go through Mary. They didn't have to go through the popes. They didn't have to go through the priests. They didn't have to go through the saints. They didn't have to go to, to something called confessional, where there was a man behind a box, where they had to confess all of their sins to another sinful human being just like them. They didn't have to do these things. They could go right to Christ. And as the Protestants... The reason why they were called Protestants, many people don't know this, is because they protested against the corruptions that were there in the church at that time. Protestant. We protest back to the Bible, back to Jesus. Powerful movement. It shook the world, ultimately. The, the ripples have gone out 
and will continue to go out until the end of time. Through the preaching of the gospel, Europe was enlightened and lives were changed. And I can praise God that the light of the gospel still changes lives. Hallelujah. Amen? Uh, on the screen right now, you'll see a picture of a woman who is my mother and two little boys. Guess which one of those little boys is me? <laughs> it's the one that's closest to me. <laughs> the other one is my, my brother, my brother Mike. Uh, I was born in, in the year 1959 in a Jewish family, Southern California Temple Hospital in downtown L.A. I grew up in the Hollywood Hills, surrounded by the entertainment industry. As a little boy, of course, I didn't know that. But as I got older, I felt the pull of Hollywood, the pull of Sunset, Sunset Boulevard, the pull of the strip, the pull of, of the rock and roll industry. It was all around me. This is a picture that my stepmother found uh, not too long ago going through some old photographs. It's me when I was about 19 or 18. As they say, if your friends could see you now. <laughs> I've changed a lot. I'm sitting in front of a flicking a lighter in front of a lamp that says bar. I used to love to listen to Mick Jagger jamming on the guitar and singing his song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. You know, and that was me too. I didn't have any satisfaction. Uh, I used to just, uh, I was, as time went on in my teen years, I went off the deep end into a life of drugs. I used to go to a lot of rock and roll concerts and listen, listen to groups like Black Sabbath and Aerosmith and The Tubes and Kiss and The Grateful Dead. Grateful Dead, quite a name. Uh, and everything was different. My life was a blur in my teen years. I smoked marijuana for six years. Six years, almost every day. Got into harder drugs, got into cocaine, even, even dabbled in LSD. I have friends, at least I had friends uh, back then that are no longer alive. They are six feet under the ground, dead of alcohol, dead of drugs. Had my high school reunion uh, not too long ago, my 20 year, <laughs> you can date me. And uh, I found out that some of my friends were no longer alive. Amazing. I'm not going to tell you all about how it all happened right now, but I can tell you that when I was 20 years old, and that was 22 years ago, in the year 1979, during the summer, I started reading the Bible for the first time in my life. God worked through a whole series of amazing events, amazing events. And he eventually revealed to me, as I studied the New Testament, he revealed to me the love and the mercy and the power of Jesus Christ. And I saw that I had a Savior, a Messiah, Jewish Messiah, who loved me, who suffered for me, even though I was a sinner, even though I was lost in drugs, even though my mind was so mixed up, the dark ages were dark in my life. But in the midst of all of that, the Lord shined his light on me. And his light came into my life. I saw Jesus. I accepted him as my Savior by faith, by grace, through the gospel, through the Bible. God saved my soul. Hallelujah. And he picked me up. He reached me right where I was. He picked me up and he changed my life. You see also on the screen a picture of, of uh, my wife, my, our wedding day. Kristen is here somewhere. She's probably smiling out there somewhere. But, uh, you know, if you could see the way I was... And what the Lord has done for me now, he gave me a Christian wife, changed my life, called me into the ministry, gave me a message to preach from the Bible. It's a miracle of the gospel of God. God is good. Praise the Lord. He can change lives. Hallelujah. He can still do it. He did it back then. He can do it now. Now let's go back to Europe, back to the dark ages. In the 1500s, the light began to shine. The light of Jesus, the light of grace, the light of God's power began to ripple and shine all over Europe. But sadly, the response of the Church of Rome at that time was not good. There was a, an index of books that were forbidden for anyone to read on the penalty of death. And guess what one of those books was? A Bible. If you were caught reading a Bible in your native tongue, you could be put to death. The flames would rise around you and you would be burnt to ashes. Amazing. Martin Luther and his followers were condemned as heretics and sentenced to death. And once again, the flames of the martyrs, 
the flames of the martyrs began to rise in Europe and hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands were cruelly tortured and put to death. And a great battle ensued, a battle for truth, a battle between right and wrong. And I also should say that most of the Protestants started out as Catholics, but they were open, as many Catholics are today. Catholic people love the Lord uh, just like Protestants. And they're trying just like anybody else. And most people have no knowledge of history these days. They've just lost it. So they don't know the issues. But a lot of those people were members of the Church of Rome, but they were honest priests, and they saw the light, and they accepted Jesus just like is happening today. But back then, the battle raged. As opposition grew, Martin Luther in Germany really began to study his Bible. Now, first he had studied and he discovered Jesus Christ that Jesus was the Savior, and he began to preach this. But as the opposition began to mount against him, as he was condemned to death, as he was fearful that the flames would rise about him at any day, he continues to study, and eventually Luther turned to the prophecies. Turn in your Bibles to Daniel 7. Luther began to study about the four beasts of Daniel 7, representing Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. He studied about the ten horns that we've talked about, and then he studied about that little horn, that little horn that would come up. He studied 2 Thessalonians 2. He studied Revelation, and he studied Daniel 7. If you look at Daniel 7, verse 8, Luther studied about this horn, this little horn. Verse 8 says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn there were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And in verse 21, the Bible says, I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. So Luther read about this horn that came out of the fourth beast, which represented what empire? The Roman Empire. It came out of the Roman Empire. It came up among the ten horns in Western Europe. It had eyes like the eyes of a man, representing human leadership at the head. It had a mouth speaking great things. And eventually, it made war on the saints. Here's a quotation from Ferraris' Ecclesiastical Dictionary, a well-respected dictionary in the Church of Rome, in an article on the Pope. And it says, The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. And there are a lot of statements, historical statements, I don't have time to share with you right now, but I could share them. And as you look at these statements, and as you look at your Bible, and as you look at history, the Bible says he would have a mouth speaking great things, and folks, there's a lot of great things that have come out of the church historically. And as far as war on the saints, there's no question about it. And as far as it coming out of Rome, no doubt. Rising up among the ten horns in Europe, no question. And as Luther studied these prophecies, his eyes were opened, and he finally realized that not only had he discovered Jesus Christ, but guess what else he had discovered? He realized in the blazing light of Bible truth that he also discovered Antichrist. The Reformation was a twofold discovery of Christ and Antichrist. This book, Daubigny's History of the Protestant Reformation, is an amazing piece of history and literature. I've been reading it, and here's a statement on page 215. And it says here that Luther proved by the revelations of Daniel and St. John and by the epistles of Paul, Peter, and St. Jude that the reign of Antichrist predicted and described in the Bible was the papacy. The word papacy means uh, the office of the popes, not the people themselves, but the office, the papal office, and the claims that are made for that office. And it says... A holy terror seized upon people's thrones as Luther began to preach this. This new idea which derived greater strength from the prophetic descriptions launched forth by Luther into the midst of his contemporaries inflicted a terrible blow upon Rome. It was a battle and Luther was in the front of it, right in the front of it. Few people realize this today. I heard a statement just the other day that said, in fact I read it, it said, Protestants there still are but Protestantism is no more. Protestantism is just about gone. I heard an, uh, an ad the other day from, I think it was John MacArthur, has written a book called The Vanishing Conscience. I was very intrigued by that. A friend of mine said to me some time ago, he said, I'd like to write a book called The Vanishing Protestant. Powerful title. 
Most people do not realize what Protestant means, protest. Most people have no idea that there were two fundamental pillars of the Protestant Reformation, two primary fundamental doctrines, and these, this is them. These, th here they are right here. Number one, salvation is by the unmerited grace of Jesus Christ through the gospel. And the second fundamental pillar is that the papacy is the antichrist of scripture, the little horn and the beast of Revelation. Here's a statement from the book All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael DeSemlin, published in 1991. He said, there are two great truths that stand out in the preaching that brought about the Protestant Reformation. Number one, the just shall live by faith, not by the works of Romanism. And number two, the papacy is the antichrist of scripture. It was a message for Christ and against Antichrist. The entire Reformation rests upon this two-fold testimony. The title of this whole series is called The Antichrist Chronicles, What Prophecy Teachers Are Not Telling You. Have prophecy teachers told you that? Have they told you that the Protestant Reformation had these two fundamental pillars? This doctrine has been lost in history, but it's as biblical, it's as solid, it's as historical as anything can be. It was taught by the great Protestants, by the great churches, by the Baptists, by the Methodists, by the Lutherans, by the Presbyterians for hundreds of years. But things have changed. A lot of things have changed. We need to go back to the Bible. Now, of course, what happened in history was the Roman church responded in the 1500s, and they reacted vehemently with what is called the Counter-Reformation. They convened a big council in the year 1545. It went on all the way through the, until the year 1563 in a northern city, city of, uh, north of, of Rome in Italy called Trent. This was the center of the Counter-Reformation. There was an organization that had been newly created called the Society of Jesus, otherwise known as the Jesuits. And this group was set aside with the special commission to counteract the teaching of the Protestants, especially their doctrine about the Antichrist. One particular man by the name of Francisco Ribera he was specifically commissioned. He was a Jesuit from Spain, a brilliant doctor, and he was commissioned to develop a counter-interpretation to what the Protestants were teaching about the Antichrist based upon the Bible. In the year 1590, Ribera came out with a book, Thoughts on the Book of Revelation, and this book began to circulate in Europe. And here's a quotation here from George Eldon Ladd, great Bible scholar. He wrote this in his book called The Blessed Hope, A Biblical Study of the Second Advent and the Rapture in the year 1956, and this is what he said. Now look at this, quote. He said, in 1590, Ribera pu published a commentary on the book of Revelation as a counter-interpretation to the prevailing view among Protestants which identified the papacy with the Antichrist. And this is what Ribera said. He said, is instead of it being the papacy, he said Antichrist would be a single evil person who would be received by the Jews and who would build up Jerusalem. So Ribera, while Luther was preaching from Daniel 7 and 2 Thessalonians 2 and Revelation and putting the finger on the papacy, Ribera rose up on the scene and said, no, 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 these prophecies don't apply to the papacy at all. And he took that little horn that came out of the head of the fourth beast and he cut it off and he moved it down to the end of time. And he said that Antichrist only refers to one evil, super bad guy who will show up at the very end of time. Let me ask you, have you ever heard that doctrine before? The idea that the Antichrist is only one man who will show up after we're gone? I want to tell you, folks, that doctrine is a delusion. It is a delusion. It is not based upon the true authority of God's word. Not too long ago, I was with my wife, and we were flying back from Maryland. We had gone on vacation, and we were flying back in a big plane on our way to Dallas. And as we were flying along, we, the plane ran into, into some trouble. And fortunately, we were fine, but as we got closer to DFW, to Dallas, the voice of the captain came boldly across the loudspeaker, and the voice said, I need to let you know that there are severe thunderstorms in Dallas and that this plane may have to be diverted to another airport. Now, actually what happened was the storm cleared and we were able to land safely. But when I, I went through that, 
You know, I, I thought about that, and I thought, that is just what has happened to the Protestant world. If you look closely at, at this uh, airplane up there, if you have really good eyes, you'll see this airplane is called Protestant Airways. <laughs> <laughs> the Protestant church has been diverted. It has been diverted to another airport. It has totally lost its knowledge of history, its knowledge of the Reformation, its knowledge of the martyrs, its knowledge of what has happened, why Luther and his contemporaries risked their lives, and new ideas have come in and diverted the Protestant church to a totally different understanding of the Antichrist, a whole new view. Would you like to know why or how this diversion took place? I'll tell you in the next meeting of the Antichrist Chronicles. You definitely won't want to miss the next episode of the Antichrist Chronicles as Steve continues to examine the facts surrounding the mysterious biblical Antichrist. Thank you for watching. He raised up people like Martin Luther in Germany, like Tyndale in England, like John Knox in Scotland, Calvin in France, Zwingli in Switzerland, and many others, countless others, and they rose up on the scene and their focus was getting people back to the Bible, back to Jesus, and away from the traditions that were, that were just captivating and gripping people all over Europe and in other countries. And these reformers, by the grace of God, succeeded in moving Europe out of the Dark Ages.